Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me uh, through this desk mic. Uh, and hopefully you can hear me online as well. So thanks for coming and uh, thanks for joining for everyone online. Um, as Steph mentioned, we'll be talking about an application we developed called Antigen App, which is a, a web application for nanobody data management and analysis, um, which we developed using a, a DevOps style approach. So I'll break the talk into uh, three main sections. I'll start off with some scientific background, tell you what a, a nanobody is, because I'm sure many of you are curious, um, and talk about some of the data management and analysis challenges that some of our users were, uh, our experimental users at our institute were, were facing, and how that led to the creation of this piece of software. Um, I'll talk a bit about the design goals and kind of the scope of the software and what we're hoping to achieve with it. And uh, I'll talk a bit about the implementation, so the software and the tech stack that we used, um, give you a quick overview of the user interface, and uh, I'll talk a bit about Kubernetes and our use of Kubernetes and uh, reflect on some thoughts and our experience with that. So nanobodies are small antibodies that come from certain um, species, so members of the camel family, including llamas, alpacas, and so forth, and also interestingly enough from sharks. Um, antibodies uh, that you would get from um, a person are, are more like the one shown in the middle here, this monoclonal antibody, um, where there are multiple active sites and it's a relatively large molecule. Whereas when from um, in llamas, uh, you actually only have this one VHH site, which you can see, uh, it's difficult for me to point that works for everyone, but hopefully you can see it highlighted in the circle is this VHH. Um, so this is the active part of the, the nanobody that binds some antigen target. And as you can see, if you just take that section of the molecule, it's much um, smaller, simpler, um, less complex than a uh, traditional antibody would be. So um, that leads to it being um, easier to work with and cheaper to produce. And uh, for those reasons, um, it's has pro they have promising applications across imaging, diagnostics, therapeutics, drug development, and, and many other fields. So how are nanobodies produced? So I mentioned you can get them from a few different animals. So you could consider trying to get them from sharks, but uh, the thing about sharks is if you're trying to do a blood draw of a shark, it's probably more likely to draw blood from you. So uh, that option was kind of quickly eliminated by our, our health and safety team. Um, and we decided to go with the slightly safer, fluffier, friendlier option of llamas. Um, they're still a bit feisty, but it's not quite on the same level. So, um, so using a llama probably makes a bit more sense in this context. So uh, once you have your llama, um, you have some target antigen that you want to develop an antibody against. So um, this could be, for example, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein from uh, the, the coronavirus that you might have heard of. Um, after a few weeks, uh, or over time, the llama produces nanobodies and then uh, as in response to that um, foreign compound. And then uh, after a few weeks, blood is drawn from the llama and those nanobodies can be tested, purified, sequenced and taken forward to um, whatever sort of uh, therapeutic, diagnostic, imaging, et cetera, use there is for them. So that's the kind of really quick overview of what, of what uh, nanobodies are for. So our experimentalist team at the, at the Franklin um, are generating a lot of nanobody data now. Um, they're, they're scaling up rapidly. Um, experimental data generation is, is ongoing um, and they're developing uh, nanobodies against lots of different uh, antigen targets uh, using lots of different llamas uh, and there are multiple nanobody candidates for each antigen. And to top this off, the experimental pipeline has lots of stages to it. There's lots of different data types. And essentially they were getting, it was very difficult to juggle around all the different Excel spreadsheets and proprietary file formats. They wanted a way to capture, share, analyze those data more easily. Um, so some of the data types, uh, just to give you a quick flavor, as ELISA experiments. So these are basically um, where you have multiple wells in a plate and you have nanobodies in those wells and they want to make binding strength of antigens against of nanobodies to those um, antigens. Um, also in 96 world plates, you have the nanobodies prepared for DNA sequencing. So they're laid out in a plate and you have to obviously keep track of that metadata, which nanobodies are where. Um, the sequencing results that come back, so you need to store those DNA sequences somewhere and then doing downstream bioinformatics analysis. So looking for regions of interest of those nanobodies um, sequences and doing things like similarity and clustering and any, any further bioinformatic downstream analysis. Um, okay, so in terms of the software design goals, um, so as I mentioned, the first challenge was to organize all this data. So um, we wanted to capture all those experimental results, store their provenance, metadata, change logs that have kind of full auditability and traceability of, um, of who had done what and when. 
Um, we want to automate and streamline data capture and analysis. So this is sort of efficiency gains. We want to make their experimental work as efficient as possible and minimize the amount of time they have to spend wrangling spreadsheets. And uh, the final short-term goal was to do um, to build in some nanobody bioinformatic and statistical analysis capabilities within the software, um, not to the scale of a full toolkit, but just to make the kind of quick first look analyses um, available so that they are um, something I don't have to leave this software to do. Longer term, um, we'd like to expand this out to um, the, our facility would like to um, start off doing nanobody generation and analysis as a service. So uh, this would be where someone would come to our institute and ask for a nanobody against, to be generated against a particular antigen, and then they would um, do that and then provide some sort of initial bioinformatics with that as service as well. And um, we also want to build in as many data sharing capabilities and integrations as we can into the software as possible, having an API and trying to keep things uh, open. So in terms of the efficiency gains, we try and build these in wherever we can and have things, you know, drag and drop and, and kind of intuitive and simple as, as best we can. So there's drag and drop data entry. You can see an example of this on the right with sort of a slider to adjust um, thresholds when the video doesn't jump around too violently. Uh, you can you can sort of see that as you as you adjust that slider, you can see which of the wells on the plate are included, which they found was a, a nice kind of quick visual feedback um, for something that they were doing fairly manually before. Um, as drag and drop Excel data upload, um, we do a lot of the bioinformatics pre-processing within the app, so kind of trimming the the the, the, um, the protein sequences and preparing them for an inter interface with an external service called IMGT, which does bioinformatics uh, as a web service. Um, Pre-formatting sequencing request forms, so again, kind of reducing the amount of manual steps. They can just download the, the sequencing form that's sent off to the external sequencing company straight from the software. Um, and then when the sequencing results come back, automatically running all the bioinformatics on that uh, as soon as that file is uploaded. Uh, we try and integrate with existing tools wherever possible. Um, Uniprop for protein information. So you enter a protein ID and get the, the protein information back, its molecular weight and sequence and so on. Um, we're looking at tools for proposal management. That's sort of a still in discussion stage. Um, I mentioned integrating with bioinformatics um, services. We use one called IMGT FeedQuest, which does uh, nanobody analysis. And um, mm -hmm. KeyCloak and Kubernetes, which use for single sign-on and container management, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the software stack and implementation in this in this next section. So we went with a relational database, um, in this case Postgres, to store all these data. Um, each of these purple rectangles is a, is a table. You can see the user table is linked to everything because that's for auditability, so um, you need to track um, basically changes and which user made those and when. Um, and I won't go through this in too much detail, but essentially it's organized around projects and within projects you have libraries and cohorts and then um, you have to keep track of which llamas and antigens are involved and then you have the experimental data uh, of the ELISA plates and the sequencing run. So that's kind of um, roughly how things are stored in the database. Um, I'll give you a quick video demo of, uh, of how the, the software works. Um, apologies if this is also a bit quick, but I'll hopefully it gives you the main features. So we have a single sign-on, which we use um, KeyCloak for. Um, so our users can um, use their, their single sign-on ID. Um, and then there's basically a data entry interface. So this is adding a project, um, you know, pretty simple data entry stuff where they can just type in some project title uh, description. You can obviously edit, delete, update, all those kinds of things. Um, so adding an antigen, you can enter a, a Uniprot ID, which is a, kind of a, an identifier for the protein. And then when you click save the um, the preferred name, sequence, molecular mass that you can see there have all been fetched automatically. So minimizing the number of data entry steps that have to be done um, manually. Uh, looking at a llama entry now, and you can see audit log. So this sort of shows you all the changes, um, keeps track of everything that's been changed within the system. So you have a full change management. Um, and then this is just quickly going into the experimental data. So you have a schematic of, a, of an ELISA plate here with some, um, some binding strength values. And then the sequencing runs, um, so this is just metadata of keeping track of what's been sent off for, for sequencing with that slide that you, you saw before and show here again, um, where you can basically adjust the threshold for what binding strength you want to, the experimentalists want to include to be sent off for sequencing. And then finally, there's this integrated browsable API that's based on Django REST framework, um, which is a really nice Python and Django framework that kind of gives you this built-in API browser for free. So that's a kind of quick overview of the uh, of the user interface. 
Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the technology platform. So it's built on Python Django REST framework, as I mentioned, that's the back end and data storage is done um, in a Postgres relational database and using S3 buckets for file storage. Um, we use Keycloak for identity and access management. So um, uses single sign-ons and defining um, via groups and roles who has access to what. The front end is written in HTML, JavaScript and React. Um, we use a SaaS called Sentry uh, from the top left, which is a, a nice error monitoring and alerting platform, um, which alerts us if there's any issues with the software. Um, for container orchestration, so both the back end and the front end are running in containers. Um, this is all running on a, a Kubernetes system based on STFC OpenStack, which is a, a, um, a private cloud run by Science and Technologies Facilities Council at the Harwell Oxfordshire site. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention the CICD. So this is continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, where when a Git commit is pushed to GitHub, uh, GitHub Actions workflow runs, which tests the software, runs the unit test suite, builds a container, um, both back end and front end containers, and pushes those to our container repository, which is key.io. And then on Kubernetes, we have a piece of software called Argo CD running, which um, runs continuous deployment. So when there's a change to the container, it can automatically deploy that new one into the dev environment to keep that um, up to date. And this all uses a framework called GitOps, which is a, a way of defining um, configuration manifests within a text file within Git so that everything is version controlled and you, know, you can roll back to previous versions of the software and have everything nicely controlled, uh, version controlled and managed in that way. So some challenges along the way. Um, the, the experimental pipeline and kind of the stages for that and trying to understand the experimentalist's uh, language and trying to convert that into a relational database schema is, is uh, always a bit challenging. It took several meetings to kind of get that hammered down and to try and work out um, exactly what they meant by their various terms and how they related to each other. Um, but I think we, we, we got there in the end. Um, that did lead partially to us having to do um, rewrite some of the front end. So. Um, we, we had some students who were working on the project and uh, because they were only with us for 12 weeks and we wanted to give them experience of writing software, probably got started sooner than we should have done because we didn't really have a full set of requirements at that point. Um, so through no fault of the students and they did some great work, we had to end up sort of redoing part of that. Um, as just kind of, I guess, the way the uh, the timings worked out when the students were working with us. But um, I feel like, you know, that when you rewrite something, you can always you have a better idea about how it's going to work the second time around, right? And you can make a better go of it. So um, I think it all worked out pretty well in the end. Um, and then finally, kind of the expectation and time management side. So we work on multiple different projects and split our time between um, working on infrastructure and, and software development projects like this one. So trying to um, basically uh, talk with the users and communicate uh, the expectations about when, when we can get things done by and trying to be realistic about those. Um, is always good and trying to keep those sort of lines of communication open um, is, is always a good thing to do. So in the last uh, five minutes or so, um, I will talk a little bit about uh, why, why we chose to use Kubernetes and how we're using it at the Rosalind Franklin Institute in general and some of the advantages, drawbacks, and kind of some thoughts there. Um, since I think there was, some, there was some interest, at least in the feedback that I got from the abstract that I submitted for this talk. So um, some advantages of using Kubernetes, you can standardize your development and production environments using containers. So it kind of gives you, um, minimizes the difference between what you're working on in your laptop and what's on the actual production server. So it reduces a whole class of, uh, of potential errors and, and, um, and things creeping in. Um, for CI CD, um, you can do CI, of course, you know, you don't need to use containers or Kubernetes for that, but for the pipeline that we're using, um, it does, it gives you, um, in GitHub Actions, you can use automated building and testing the containers, and then um, you can use Argo CD and another um, popular framework is called Flux. Um, we went with Argo, which lets you uh, deploy those containers straight into Kubernetes and kind of keep them up to date and version controlled and managed in a nice way. Um, single sign-on on authentication. So uh, with Kubernetes, you can use what's called an ingress controller. So this is essentially a web server that sits um, as the entry point into um, the Kubernetes cluster and acts a bit like a reverse proxy if you've used a web server in that capacity before. Um, but you can get some nice plugins for it. We're using OAuth 2 proxy and Keycloak. And then what that lets you do is to build a single sign-on layer that you can then reuse for multiple applications. So you can kind of um, reuse these design patterns without having to make every application um, authentication aware. You can just put this kind of um, authentication wall in front of, uh, in front of any other container. Um, 
You can use init containers. So these are essentially like a startup script for an application that can run when an application is upgraded. So in our case, we're using this to apply database migration. So when there's a change to the database schema um, and that upgrade is applied, uh, the cluster automatically runs the upgrade script against, against the database. So again, kind of eliminating manual steps and reducing the potential thing that we could forget on, a, on an upgrade. Um, Kubernetes, they have a lot of um, things called operators, which are essentially software that manages other software. Um, so one example of this is um, for Postgres databases. Um, the operator essentially can manage the operation of Postgres for you. Um, to a degree, there's still some configuration involved, but um, you can automate backups. Um, you can set up failover and high availability in a way that I think is much easier to do in Kubernetes and outside of it, um, since it's the operator sort of provides all the tooling for you for that. Um, so you kind of get this, again, another sort of reusable pattern that you can use across multiple applications. Um, and you can get automatic TLS certificate renewal where you configure cert manager as the tool we're using at cluster level. Again, you could do this kind of for individual applications using something like cert bot and cron jobs, but the advantage here is, you know, you set this up once for the cluster and then you can, can reuse it. I mentioned standardization um, it gives you the advantage that you can um, deploy an application anywhere and it works more or less the same way. Um, we've we've actually adopted a, a new operating system for our Kubernetes cluster called Talos Linux, which has been a, actually a really nice experience, even though it's pretty new. Um, it gives you a dedicated Kubernetes-only operating system. It has no shell, no SSH, um, and basically is designed just to run Kubernetes, which reduces the attack service and the maintenance, and uh, has been you know a pretty good experience for us because it's um, it takes care of a lot of the manual setup steps that you'd otherwise have to do if you're installing Kubernetes directly on top of uh, Ubuntu or Red Hat or another operating system. Um, it can reduce your costs in that you can run multiple applications per host. Um, uh, it increases your resilience and that uh, if a server goes down, Kubernetes can automatically start the container elsewhere. Um, the main disadvantage really is is the learning curve. There's lots there's a bit of complexity in getting things set up. Um, but uh, but I, I, th I think it's you know a lot of that it could just comes at the initial stage um, of of deploying the cluster and then once you kind of get up and running and learn the the broadly how the Kubernetes YAML and things are structured then it becomes a, a bit more straightforward. So um, I'll, I'll finish off just with some thoughts um, uh, on sort of should you should would I recommend others use Kubernetes so. Um, you might have seen this XKCD comment before about automation, where you have this um, in the top, you have this, uh, you're working on some task and you decide to automate it and there's some, you have to spend some time on the automation, but then in theory, you're going to have so much free time afterwards, right? And it's all going to be great. Um, but the reality is often more like the bottom one where you, you think, okay, I'll automate this. And then you spend so much time working on your automation solution that you have no time for the original task anymore. So that's the kind of scenario that you want to avoid and this this can apply you know just as much to kubernetes as, as any other system um so to answer the question should should you use kubernetes um my my thoughts on that would be if you're at very small scale and that you're not using many web applications or your team size is quite small then then probably not um you're not really going to get the advantages of these reusable patterns at that sort of scale but i feel like when you're hitting three four five people um, and you're deploying maybe five or more web applications. That's sort of the point at which I would suggest it's worth considering. Um, so, um, but you, I, the, the thing is you have to kind of set your expectations appropriately, I think is, is what I would say. Um, try, try not to adopt too many things. There's lots of things in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Try and stick to a fairly minimal system to start with and then only adopt, incrementally adopt things as they're actually necessary and, uh, and kind of aware of that scope creep. Um, so that's about it. I'll just thank for some acknowledgements from, uh, from the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Thanks to all the team there who worked on this, experimentalists um, and the RSC team at Diamond Light Source for the students we have working on this project, uh, BBSRC and UKRI for funding. Um, the software is all open source and there's the URL. And uh, with that, I will finish. Thanks very much. I think you basically answered the first question on Slido, uh, which... Oh, uh, which was asking at what scale should you uh, adopt uh, Kubernetes over something with a much more simple set of overhead? Anything I, I, you'd like to add? Yeah, I, th I think the scale is decreasing over time because many people might be aware Kubernetes originally came out of, uh, of Google and was designed for sort of really large scale operations. And that's where the initial benefit was. And there was a lot of complexity to it. But over time, there's been lots of projects like Talos Linux, um, like Minikube uh, and K3s 
and, and projects like this, where they're, they're trying to simplify that sort of startup overhead and the complexity of running Kubernetes where now. Um, if, if, you, if you're running a lot of web applications, then, then it makes sense to, certainly yeah. to look into it. Great, thank you. Um, uh, the next question we have is, can other teams that are working on health data use Antigen as the platform and how easy is it to modify the platform for different projects? Um, so the software is open source, it's on GitHub, you can uh, feel free to take a look. Um, in terms of health data, it's it's not designed for sort of um, for protected health records or anything like that. This is all working with um, uh, experimental data, so I, I wouldn't recommend it if you were use if you, were, you know, had patient data or anything like that. Um, in terms of adaptability, uh, it's it's kind of mainly designed as a data entry platform that's built around our, our facilities needs with a view to kind of expanding it as a service. Um, but for sure, it's, it's open source, so people can feel free to take a look. And if they have any questions, then uh, drop me a line. Cool, thank you. Uh, and let me think. Yeah. Uh, how are you managing the overhead of developing and running Kubernetes and how are you ensuring you've got long-term support to keep them contained? Um, so the overhead of running Kubernetes. So we are we we actually um, have various infrastructures that we're running on the STFC cloud, so um, on their open stack. So in terms of managing the physical machines and the, and, the, and the virtual machines and the networking, that's all handled by STFC, which is nice. So we'd have to deal with that side of it. Um, but we do run Kubernetes ourselves, but that's essentially um, not really much different to any other operating system in that you have to plan for um, you know, upgrades and, and potentially for, um, for downtime, although it's easier to manage your Kubernetes and other systems. Um, but Talos Linux makes it pretty easy in that you, uh, the only thing you really have to do is just run, the, run an upgrade script uh, against each node in the cluster. And, and that's really the only sort of major maintenance that you, you have to, uh, to, to do with it. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. And if, you, if, you, if you're already administering something like an Ubuntu box or a Red Hat box, I don't think there's um, many extra skills needed to, uh, to sort of run a basic Kubernetes cluster, at least. You can layer on extra complexities. That doesn't, that doesn't apply to every case. But in the basic case, I would say it's, it's, it's certainly worth a look. Perfect. Uh, I will try one more as well. Uh, so you had multiple people involved, and they worked on multiple projects and different bits of each one. How do you feel, or do you have a feel for the number of people in FT equivalent which went into Antigen App, and how was it funded? Uh, so in terms of funding, it was um, part of a BBSRC grant. Um, in terms of the uh, number of uh, full-time equivalent, um, so it's probably been at least at least one full-time equivalent at uh, our RSC level, I think, that's been been working on this. Um, at times, there have been uh, a student working on this. So we had two students working on it, and they were doing twelve-week projects. Um, so they contributed to it. Um, so yeah, so it's about one FTE equivalent that's been going for uh, nearly two years now. So yeah, yeah. nice, brilliant present. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much.